So Dr. Trask is a principal member of the research staff at Sandia National Labs, leading several projects employing machine learning for multi-physics simulation and scientific discovery. He obtained his PhD in applied math from Brown University in 2016, working with professors Martin Maxey and George Carniadakis, and will be joining the Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics Department at the University of Pennsylvania this fall as an associate professor. And with that, let me turn you over to Dr. Trask. Great. Thanks for the intro, and it's a, it's a pleasure to speak here. Um, if anybody has questions or um, uh, feel free to interrupt and grab a mic, I'm happy at any point to just pause and talk. Um, if you have stuff that you want to follow up with at the end, um, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll have an email address up here or you can get it from Matt. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to share a little bit about uh, the Department of Energy National Lab Complex. So there's a lot of different labs. Um, some of those are Office of Science Labs. Those have a basic research focus. I'm at Sandia National Labs, which is, um, it, it, it's called an NNSA lab, but those are the labs that were part of the Manhattan Project. Um, if you're familiar with that history, um, their mission now is kind of expanded on to other things beyond uh, the, the stuff that people worked on during the Manhattan Project. But um, uh, but it's, they're, that's a smaller subset of labs. Um, and so within Sandia, we have two campuses, one in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, that's where I'm at, and the other one is Sandia Livermore, uh, which is in the Bay Area. So within, um, within Sandia, it's, it's just a massive place. It, it's much larger than a university, if that's probably what, what y'all have uh, exposure to so far. Um, so uh, there's a lot of diverse application areas. Um, my department, we, we work on the computing and information sciences side, which includes stuff like high performance computing and math and, and so on. There's also people working on um, radiation science, high energy density science. So that's stuff like pulse power fusion. Um, you know, fusion's in the news a ton lately, uh, but material science, traditional engineering sciences, it's like mechanical civil type things biosciences, nano devices, microsystems, geoscience, um, a ton of stuff about microelectronics and, you know, so just, just a huge swath of different things uh, go on here um, with uh, thousands and thousands of people. So it's a very large scale place. So within my little niche, I'm part of the Center for Computing Research, um, which is maybe a few hundred people. And what we look at is things like developing of open source software libraries for doing high performance uh, supercomputing, um, things like that. And, and so those libraries allow us to um, allow us to do simulation for a lot of big problems that are of interest um, for national security and then also um, science, just basic science for the world. So we do a lot of things like um, like climate and weather prediction. So we do massive um, exascale simulations of um, of the entire earth system so when you when you do something like you check the weather on your phone that's actually referencing back to a, a model that, that we support with, with these kind of libraries um, also research um, on the hardware side about um, about different computing systems and, and so on so it's really like the interface between uh, math and computer science together with um, hardware and so that includes stuff like um, traditional simulation, um, but more recently machine learning, um, neuromorphic computing, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so I've, I have my email address listed here. Um, please feel free to reach out if you're, if you're curious and you want to learn more about Sandia. Um, and before I get started, um, we're working within the national labs is really a is, is very team based. It's a lot different from when people go to graduate school and it's kind of you working with your advisor with your head down in a book um, learning one thing. So we, the best part about the national labs is when I want to work on a new problem, I just go down the hallway and like the world expert on whatever thing um, is right there. Um, so I've listed here on my collaborators, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to present um, is done in teams of maybe four or five people, some of the bigger projects, 20 to 30 people um, and, and so on. So the way I'm going to structure this talk, um, is I'd like to give a high level 
introduction to how scientific machine learning is used at, at the national labs and to keep from getting bogged down in the math. You know, a, a lot of the research that we do is very focused on the nuts and the bolts of the math and um, how, how to how to prove things, how to rigorously do a lot of these methods and develop new methods and so on. But the way I'm, I chose to structure this today is to focus on different application areas across the lab where, where we apply the tools that we develop. Um, so hopefully this will be a good way for you to get a sense of what kind of work gets done at a national lab um, and how, you know, th this is a little bit different from how machine learning is employed, you know, what, what you would learn um, probably in the machine learning courses you're taking right now. In a scientific context, it's, um, these tools are used in sort of a, a different way than they were initially developed. Um, so first I'm gonna introduce uh, what we call data-driven modeling. And then I'll go over how data-driven models form some building blocks that you can use to simulate very large complex systems. So this would be stuff like the earth climate system, or um, I'll, I'll talk a lot about semiconductors and microelectronics and stuff like that. And then finally, I'll talk about how these can be used. Um, you know, people talk about self-driving labs or, or using AI to steer what experiments get performed and so on. So I'm part of a large project to do those kind of, to employ those kind of ideas in um, material science and, and manufacturing. So first I'll, I'll talk about data-driven modeling and just share some exemplar problems where, that we've worked at, across the lab. Um, so the way to think about modeling um, is that classically, maybe since, since like the 30s and the 40s, um, especially in the Manhattan Project, that's where a lot of simulation kicked off as a very powerful tool. Um, the, the idea is that you would sit down with pencil and paper and you would derive the, the equation. So maybe if you took high school physics, right, the, the sum of the forces is equal to the acceleration, right? So you, you need to derive a model like that that gives an equation that then you could take to a computer and you can solve those equations. And that'll give a prediction of how a system will evolve. And so that everything that you know, um, like cars, airplanes, whatever, that, that's how all these things are, are designed nowadays. Um, pretty large computer simulations, but the underlying idea is that someone can derive a model. So for a lot of the physics that, that we care about at the national lab, the, the physics are just too complex to actually derive with pencil and paper. Uh, so a lot of what we do is um, instead of trying to derive what the physics are, um, the, the governance system, instead we collect data in, in terms of um, either physical experiments or maybe we can do a whole collection of simulations on some small reduced part of a system and then we want to agglomerate all of those into some sort of big model. So we do all sorts of things um, to develop these kind of data-driven models with machine learning, um, things like um, transistors, you know, electrical components and things like that. Um, we look at shock physics. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about this later, but how shocks propagate through materials, stuff about subsurface fracture. So that's how um, for carbon sequestration um, and also some national security problems, it, it's very interesting to understand um, how, how mass gets transported through rock and, and things like that. It's actually a surprisingly uh, deep uh, problem if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then also we do a lot of stuff for solid mechanics. So this is stuff like, we have a picture of a car here. You can imagine, you know, like a crash test dummy or whatever when, when a car crashes into a wall. There, there are thousands of, if not millions of components in a car that you have to account for how they all interact um, uh, during that sort of fracture process. So these are all the sorts of systems that we're considering. And so you're probably, you know, I'm assuming for this audience that y'all have some, some sense of traditional machine learning. Um, and so what I'll mostly be talking about is supervised learning here. And traditionally in stuff like, um, you know, Google and Facebook and, and so on, all these big applications, they have huge data sets. And really what they're looking at is how to interpolate um, within this data set. You know, they have many examples of, um, you know, what movies a population of people like. So now if you show them a new person, you can predict what movie they would like. Right? So that'd be an example of supervised learning. So in a scientific context, right, there's no physics there. You're just, you're, you're just doing a glorified version of linear, you know, fitting a linear line 
to data and using that to extrapolate it, like maybe some of us did in high school. Um, so um, part of a, a center that I, I was a part of, we, we developed something called physics informed neural networks. And the idea there is that you don't wanna just fit data, right? Like minimize the mismatch between a neural network and, and some data, but you also want that neural network to satisfy some sort of model. And so the idea with physics informed machine learning is that you're gonna penalize the mismatch. So maybe you wanna predict a fluid flow field, um, but you know that flow field has to solve, uh, solve what's called the Navier-Stokes equation. So that'd be conservation of mass and momentum for a fluid. So you would penalize how, how it departs from that. And the stuff that my group is focusing on is, um, you know, it gets more into the math, so I won't get too much into it here. Um, but instead of penalizing the physics, what you want to do is construct a neural network that automatically satisfies the physics. Like it's just been built together in just the right way. And so that's very different from Google and Facebook, right? Where they have these kind of off the shelf architectures. Um, the stuff that we build is really kind of bespoke to a given application or physics. And there's a lot of, a lot of details there. And so um, we want to employ these things in high consequence engineering settings where there have to be certain guarantees. So, um, you know, there's potentially lives on the line. You have to guarantee that you're going to predict a physical system in a way that's physically realizable, like meaning it doesn't violate like conservation of mass, momentum, energy, stuff like that. It also has to be accurate. It also has to um, couple together appropriately with other models in our ecosystem of models. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as time goes on. This is the real distinction between, you know, computer science machine learning versus scientific machine learning. And so um, for those, I, I'm not sure how many people here have, you know, sort of an engineering background, but um, there, there's something that machine learning can't really do, which is emulate engineering judgment. So I have the story I like to tell about when I was in undergrad, there's this introductory course in mechanical engineering called statics. And it's like, you wanna find the forces and the torques on a bridge and, and trusses and, and stuff like that. And so what you, what you do in order to solve this is you, build a system of equations, one equation for each beam in, inside this truss structure. And you wanna calculate what's the, the force holding this bridge up. And so I was a, I was kind of a naive, <laughs> I, I come from math and I was starting to get into mechanical engineering and I was like, oh, okay, I'll just solve this massive system of equations. And the way that you're taught in mechanical engineering is instead of trying to just brute force solve something, you creatively, draw what's called a control volume around your system. And you say, okay, um, we know that the forces are balanced within this blob. And so all of those forces really just interact with the point that's holding it up right here, right? And so you can reduce it cleverly to one single equation at this point, which you can solve in, in like five seconds. So that it's kind of a weed out thing that they do in these introductory courses that they see who understands how to be creative like this, as opposed to just brute force where they would have to spend maybe 20 minutes just doing linear algebra or something like that. So the question is, can we get machine learning to do this kind of stuff to creatively identify what the relevant geometries are or subsystems of a physical system um, in order to extract a good predictive model of what's going on? So. What I have here is a, a video showing how our stuff works. And I, I'm not gonna get into the details, but the, the idea is we take the same idea from classification architectures, right? The idea that you're going to partition up the space of pictures of animals into the cat part of space and the dog part of space. And we reuse that partitioning in order to identify um, these control volumes that, that I mentioned, right? So what are the subdomains in, in a physical region where the physics work in a remarkable way. Um, and so what I've shown here is um, it's fluid flow past a cylinder. And so these dashed lines are what are called streamlines. So it's, if you drop a particle in the flow, it's where it'll get traced out. And the solid lines show our machine learning model. And so once we start training this, we're training this model to reproduce this, um, this exact solution, right? Like um, what, what's actually going on. And you can see in the background, we have these subdomains, which are partitioning um, space. And so what it's finding are um, 
geometric regions where the what are called the fluxes are exactly balanced, right? So if you add up all how all of the mass enters and leaves this domain, it's exactly equal to zero because mass is conserved. So that's sort of the idea is that we can take these very high fidelity, um, either something like an exact solution to a, to a model or an experiment or something that says exactly how things are going on. And then we're gonna use machine learning to extract a model that, that can reproduce that. And then we're gonna go and, and do stuff with it. So um, how, how do we do those things around the lab? Um, one of the amazing things about the National Labs is just the scale of the science that, that gets done. So we have something um, that's called the Z-Machine, uh, which is a pulse power fusion reactor. And it's not a, a reactor in the sense of something that, you know, like a coal power plant that, that would power your, your town. Um, the idea with this is it creates a fusion environment just for a, a very small fraction of a second so you can do scientific experiments and, and learn how materials and other things um, react to fusion environments. Um, so it's really an engineering design tool. It's not, it's not meant for power production. But now that fusion power is, has become viable and there's a push to build fusion reactors, this is where we're doing a lot of experiments to, to figure out how you would actually design components that, um, that would go into, into a power plant. So this is something about the size of a, a hockey rink um, at Sandia, there's like hundreds, if not thousands of people that, that work on this. And the way it's structured is you have this whole, this whole thing, and around the perimeter of the building, there are these capacitor banks. So these are like two-story um, batteries, essentially, that just hold a, just an absolute massive amount of, of electricity. And so in the very center, in a teeny, teeny tiny thing about the size of a shoebox, we have what's called the target. And so we would place something in the target to be studied. And when the, it's called a shot, when people do a shot of the experiment, you discharge the capacitors and it pumps all that, that electricity into this teeny tiny box. And so that's essentially the same as, as, you know, if you're familiar with the with a disposable camera, I don't know if anyone even uses these anymore, but like when you wind them up, that's charging a small capacitor and you hit um, the flash and, and, and it makes a flash go off to illuminate your photograph. It's the exact same principle here, but just at a astronomically larger scale. And so for that, that's how you generate a, a fusion environment just for a few moments. And so the kind of stuff that we're doing, one kind of example is uh, something called a flyer plate experiment. Um, so you have a material and you wanna understand how it reacts under very extreme environments. So you use the electromagnetic field that this device generates to launch a plate and smash it into this material. And so that sends a shock that ripples through um, that ripples through the, the test material. And so we can also do simulations of this kind of stuff. So this is a molecular dynamic simulation that we do where um, you can't do these for very much material because it's such an expensive simulation, but you can simulate every single atom um, inside this material. And so for example, this is simulation that my colleagues have done looking at a shock propagating through copper. Um, and so what we're interested in doing is how can we extract a model for, um, for more complex geometries that are larger, but you can't afford to do these molecular dynamic simulations. So what we do is we take data from here and we can see how a shock propagates. And now we'll extract something uh, called an equation of state. So some of you might be familiar with something called an ideal gas law. That's something then, you know, the 1700s or the 1800s, somebody de derived with pencil and paper. Um, this is something, it's just way too complicated to actually derive it by hand, but um, in a general setting. But now we can machine learn what an equation of state is, and people use that for simulations in the future. Um, some other things we do, um, lithium ion batteries are hugely important, both in industry and in national security settings. Um, People look at a CT scan, so they measure a cathode of a battery. Um, this is at a sub-micron scale, um, just like a small section here. And, and basically the way these batteries work is um, you have these blue lithium chunks. You have what's called a conductive binder, which are these orange particles. And then you have a, a carbon matrix, which is the white stuff, which is the structural thing that, that holds it all together. So when you turn a battery on, um, 
the lithium will kind of percolate through this network. And so it's a really hard problem to simulate because it, you have to simulate um, basically the, the transport at a microscopic scale in order to understand what's happening for like a meter sized battery pack. And what happens is um, you get these sort of transport pathways that percolate through the microstructure. And when a battery fails, it's like a crash on a highway, right? So this, you could get a fracture that could shut this down and everything will get rerouted to another path. So it's a really, really challenging problem, but, it, but it's super important. And so the idea here is um, we take these CT scans. At Sandia, we have huge departments that do simulation and they generate a database of simulations of the as-built geometry. Um, and then they have examples of what the flow should look like, you know, how, how transport should happen. And then we can train these models that I just described, um, but at a astronomically reduced cost, right? So this kind of toy 2D picture here, this would be 6 million finite elements. Um, you have to solve 6 million equations in order to get a prediction out of this. But we pull something out that has eight equations that you have to solve. So this is something that runs like 100,000 times faster. And so you can use this to do things that you couldn't previously do with simulations because now it's finally fast enough. Um, you don't need to do this on a supercomputer. You can do this like um, on a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, um, these kind of predictions. Um, we do other stuff where you have semiconductors. This is like a transistor, same sort of story. You can do simulations and it doesn't need to be a lot of simulations, maybe just one simulation. And then the tools that we develop let you um, extract a circuit model. You know, the same thing if you've taken freshman circuits or something like that, you know, the sum of the currents in, into a node have to be equal to zero, like a Kirchhoff's law kind of model. Um, and this is the same kind of thing, right? This is like six or seven equations that replace something that's like tens of thousands of equations for a traditional model. So once you have these, um, these building blocks, um, what can you do with them, right? So the way things were previously done is you would really just spend all of your computational budget, right? You would like write a grant, you get time on a supercomputer, and now you could simulate like this one battery problem that I showed, for example. Um, but now that you can extract a model that's cheap enough that you could do this in like fractions of seconds, now you can think of whole systems of models all coupled together. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm the co-director of a, a new Department of Energy Center that's looking at machine learning for, for this type of things, looking at complex systems, so people typically call it. And what we're looking at is different kinds of machine learning architectures um, that are not like convolutional networks and transformers and the kind of stuff that's popular in computer vision and natural language processing, but stuff that's more tailored towards scientific computing. And so the point is that you need something, these kind of thousand times faster speed ups, um, but then also it's very important that it's more power efficient. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this later, but it's a huge amount of power that something like GPT-3 um, consumes in order to train it. And so what we wanna do is like deploy these sensor networks on drones to collect scientific data and, and stuff like that. So you can't, you can't attach a GPU cluster to a drone and fly it through the sky. <laughs> um, you, you need something like an Arduino that you can run this stuff on. Um, so that, that's what these different kind of machine learning architectures are, um, are desirable for. And so when I talk about systems of systems, this is really um, any sort of system where you have multiple components um, that evolve in a coupled way together with each other. So one of the ones that we look at is the, it's, it's called the Earth Exascale, or, or sorry, the Energy Exascale Earth System Model. Um, which is which is this climate simulator um, that I mentioned. And so this climate simulator, it's actually, it consists of a lot of smaller simulators, like one for the atmosphere, one for the ocean, um, land ice, sea ice, earth, rivers, and, and so on. And it couples them all together in order to simulate how all of those systems interact. And so there's a lot, there's a huge amount of interest right now in building what people call digital twins. and a digital twin is a little bit of a like a buzzword, um, but the idea is you want a way of simulating a system so that you can make a prediction for how it'll evolve. So that's kind of what simulation has always been. 
um, but also that you can do data assimilation. So you can take sensors of the actual physical system and you can use them to recalibrate your model. And the hope is that you can do this in a real time sort of way. So you have a self updating model um, and you can use that to, um, to, to do all sorts of things. Um, so there's a lot of mathematical requirements about if you want to actually build a digital twin of this sort of a system of system, for example, the climate. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what you could actually do with something like that. So for the climate system, for example, what you want to learn is something causal. So for example, you could have a wildfire that happens in the land model of E3SM, and that launches a hurricane or a drought in the atmosphere model. And so what we'd like to be able to do is identify precursors to extreme events, right? So we wanna use machine learning in order to not just simulate these systems, but identify like a red flag, that something bad is about to happen and you could dispatch um, uh, emergency response uh, ahead of time and, and those, those types of things. And so, there's a lot of the machine learning that we do, which is designed to identify these kind of cause and effects relationships, which isn't really what um, traditional machine learning is, is good at. So that's hard. Um, but then also we want to deploy sensor networks that could detect these extreme events um, uh, ahead of time. So hopefully that motivates the that power requirement as well as why we need models that are a lot faster. So just to give a sense that an exascale computation, right, which is the current simulator for, for this whole system is, is what's called exascale, that runs on the largest supercomputer on earth today. So this is an example of the biggest problem that you could possibly solve, um, but that is, is just too slow and, and too expensive to actually um, do these kind of computations on. And so these kind of systems are systems are ubiquitous, like all, all, all over the place. So mechanical assemblies, you can think about how different mechanical subsystems are all gonna interact. In chemistry, um, there's a question about when you make a material, how things are happening at a molecular level, how that scales up to crystals and then up to the, the large scale um, that you would actually design uh, uh, you know, something like a car around. Um, and fusion power is, is something that, that I'm really interested in and work on um, that involves a ton of different systems that have to couple together. And so these different systems are historically simulated by these, these huge calculations and, um, and these legacy codes, like codes that are like 20 years old. Or, um, now we need to figure out how to glue them all together and make them do these kind of system scale things. So one of, one of the things that I work on is something called microelectronics co-design. And co-design is another sort of buzz, buzzword, but the idea is you want to design something like um, a circuit board, but you want to you want to bridge all of the scales, like from the material um, that you make a chip out of, right? It could be silicon or it could be a, a totally different kind of material. And we do a lot of work with gallium nitride, which is kind of a you know just a different choice of material. How that couples up to a single transistor, how different transistors couple together on a circuit board those go up all the way to, to the scale of, of like a computer or a cell phone. Um, and so when you're trying to design math that goes along with this hardware, you really have to think about like, like why, why is this an important problem right now? Right? So I, I alluded to this a little bit that chat GPT requires 4.6 exaflops to train. It's like um, it's like a million dollars to to just train one of these models. And so these big companies, they do it all the time, but it's not sustainable and it uses a ton of energy. Um, and so in scientific contexts, especially a Department of Energy, we don't have these kind of huge data sets that, um, that Google and Facebook would have access to, um, but we do have access to things like next generation um, hardware. And so these models are right, being able to design across all these scales of an electrical system is necessary in order to, to tackle um, this power efficiency problem. And so to give you a sense of how design typically goes for microelectronics, see, you kind of have this ladder of scale. So you start at the material level and the chemistry of a given 
uh, semiconductor. Um, you have physics models that goes up to how a device or a circuit works, right? So this is how an individual transistor functions. Then you would integrate this into a circuit that gets built into an architecture. And then a software engineer will design algorithms around this. And so this is typically done in a one-way manner because this is just like so complex of a, of a problem. So typically you'll have a material scientist that designs this leg of the, the ladder and then tosses their design one upward um, and, and so on until you, you complete an entire design. And you might be able to do this like two or three times or something like that. But as, um, as electronics are getting smaller and smaller, you can't, each one of these design problems doesn't neatly decouple from each other anymore, right? And so the, you know, you'll have transistors that are so close together on a circuit board that they'll, they'll have parasitic electromagnetic fields that are tied to the choice of material. So that means that you have coupling, like bi-directional coupling across rungs of this ladder. So th this is why we need these kind of machine learning tools in order to tackle this. Um, so people call this co-design, the idea that you would think about each rung of the ladder simultaneously instead of in a one-way manner. And so here's one example of microelectronics um, design problem that I was involved in. And so the idea is you wanna design what's called an optical communications relay or device. And so this is a satellite um, that goes in space and it communicates through lasers pointed at either different satellites or a receiving or a receiver on Earth. And so this thing is huge, but the entire device is really only there to point to point the laser, right? So it's really a mechanical device. It has nothing to do with the communication or the laser beam. And so the kind of microelectronics um, co-design problem is how do you shrink this down and remove the mechanical system altogether? And so it, it's kind of an, a neat problem. I don't talk about it too much, other than just to say you take a laser, you, you shape it to encode a signal into it, you split that into many copies of the same thing, and then you manipulate um, through temperature to modulate those different waveforms. So you get constructive or destructive interference, and that lets you steer a beam um, without any mechanical system. So th these are the kind of engineering problems that we're interested in doing, but you need you need to couple each one of these, you know, what I just is described are a ton of individual systems that have to be designed concurrently and you need to be able to simulate those. Machine learning lets you do that in a faster way um, so that you can actually couple all of these and look at them. Um, and so each rung of these ladders, just to give a sense of the computation, right? Simulating a material, this is something that you would run like thousands of um, CPUs on in order to make one prediction of a single material. Um, the number of transistors you would have in a given device, it, it costs, you have to solve like something like 50,000 equations to solve a single transistor. Your iPhone has a billion transistors, right? So the, um, so it's kind of this exponential growth of the computational cost. Um, then in order to develop a device model, people have developed this kind of empirically over the course of decades, but now you have a new material. How do you, how do you come up with that? Um, without taking a whole decade to kind of just do it by trial and error and, and so on. And so th this is the, the challenge. And so for traditional material stuff like CMOS, which is um, like a silicon-based transistor, that's something that people know and we've been working with for decades. But at the National Labs, we're working with new materials that um, we need to get working within a year. And it's, you know, it's kind of a high-paced thing. And that, that's why you need these better tools in order to handle it. And so these things I mentioned previously, right, that you can develop a model for a semiconductor, you might have uh, like a chip that's on a satellite in space and it's getting hit with space with solar radiation that cooks some of the circuit and it changes the way it works. So you can't just land the satellite and then do a bunch of experiments to update your model. What you need is something that can in real time aggregate data and compensate for um, for, for the, the change from, from the sort of nominal behavior. Okay, so the last, the last thing I'll talk a bit about is um, I'm, I'm leading a, a pretty big project for using these machine learning tools for scientific discovery in the context of material science. And so before I get into that, I'll just, um, I'm gonna assume most people don't know much about material science. 
But the idea, what material scientists care, care about is how do you um, design and manufacture a material um, kind of at the molecular level that has targeted electrical properties or hardness or strength or, or other things. And so we there's a lot of different materials that, that we design, um, but you could think of like thin films or coatings that you would put on top of, of an object in order to strengthen it and, and so on. So one example, like a, a well-known application for that employs most material scientists is like turbine blades on a on an airplane, for example, right? It's a really high mechanical stress environment, high temperature, and so on. So you need to design something that protects it, um, so you know it doesn't blow up. So the way material scientists think about these things is you have something. There's something called the process structure property gap. So you can think of all the knobs you have on your machine about how you're going to grow this thin film, um, and that that will you know, it's kind of like cooking, that'll cook up a thin film, but at the molecular level, that gives rise to a certain structure. Like what do the crystals look like and the geometry? Are there defects or pores inside the material and so on? So this is something that lives at the molecular level, but the thing that they actually want to design are properties. Um, so this is like, I want a material with a, with a certain strength, uh, mechanical strength or, or something like that. And so traditionally, what material scientists do is they just do a handful of experiments. They make a hypothesis about what the structure is that will correspond to, to cranking up one knob or another knob. And then they, they see if that gives you a stronger material. And the idea is we want to combine robotics and machine learning in order to not just do a, a small number of experiments that are kind of like bespoke, like hand engineered in order to explore a single hypothesis. You just want to crank through the whole design space with robotics and use machine learning to infer information. So the problem is even with robotics, um, you have nowhere near enough data in order to explore this design space. But the hypothesis is that we, you can exploit something called multimodality to overcome that small data uh, and get, get to big data in a, sort of a different direction. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by multimodality. So what I have here is a video of, um, this is a metal additive printer. So this is something um, that we work with to make custom metal parts. And the idea is it drags out a tray of metal particles. This is called laser powder bed fusion. Um, and then a laser comes in and it melts that metal powder. And then you add another layer of powder on top, melt that. And in that way, a layer at a time, you can kind of fabricate these things. So the number, I referred to the number of knobs on a system like this. And this, there's a huge number of things that you can set, like what's the power of this laser? How quickly are you gonna use it to trace out these geometries? Um, what the chemistry is in the chamber? Right? This is happening in kind of a very carefully controlled vacuum chamber. And so you can introduce different gases into that. Um, so there's a ton, it's a very high dimensional space. There's a ton of knobs that you have to figure out how to set. And it's too many to just brute force try every single permutation of. So in terms of um, the information that we can collect is, you know, you can do traditional sort of things like you put these under a microscope and it could be a very expensive microscope. There are tools like um, X-ray fluorescence or X-ray diffraction, uh, TEM, SEM. These are all different ways of, getting snapshots of what things look at at a microstructural level. And so by multimodality, what I mean is that you could combine all these different types of characterization in order to, to look at them. There's also unexploited signals, right? You can look at the spectrum of the light that's coming off the laser. We embed microphones inside this print chamber. And so these are things that if you talk to a material scientist, they would have no idea what to do with like audio coming out of a print chamber. There's just no equation for how to model that. So how do you do something useful with machine learning? Now you can exploit these kind of untapped resources, right? So across all of these modalities, right, these different types of measurements that we can get, there's just way too many modalities for a human to look like, uh, to look through. 
and identify a pattern, right? So typically people look at two of these maybe or three of these at a time, but now we can collect with automation, we can collect like 20 of them for a given system. And it's too much for a human to, to do, but we can use AI to sort of sift through it. And the real challenge about this is some of these modalities you can do first principles modeling, right? You can simulate like um, the, the, the mechanics of how a metal will respond when you pull on it. But some stuff like the X-ray spectra that you, you get when you look at the, when, when you hit the material with X-rays, you can't simulate that, right? Or, or uh, an image that you get out of microscopy, right? So there's this mix of modalities where there's some physics in some of them and, and no physics in other ones. And when you talk to material scientists, the way they want machine learning to work, which is something that machine learning can't really do right now, is they don't they don't want just like um, pattern prediction, like you feed it an image and then it spits out what the um, what the strength of the material is, and that that's what um, um, image processing right now um, from computer vision that that's the way it would be set up. Really, what they want is something um, with explainability to it. So they want to understand what is it that's going on in the material. And what is the physical processes and how do those give different like regimes of strength? So that way you can actually understand these sort of cause and effect relationships. So um, in the machine learning context, what, what we're doing is something called, it's come to be known as multimodal machine learning. Um, and maybe just within the last four years or so, this has really exploded. So this would be something like when you watch a when you're on zoom for example you could pull up live subtitles and under the hood what's going on is you, you have something that's fusing audio together with text and it's combed through tons and tons of examples of labeled lectures right some transcriptionist wrote down what somebody was saying and then it learned to just do that automatically um, so broadly the idea with multimodality is um, you, you can imagine this abstraction of a bird right so what the human brain will do is, you know, your eyes will see, it'll generate an image of the bird. Um, you could read a sentence that says a, a red-throated hummingbird in flight. And what your brain will do is it'll aggregate those things in a way that's more than the sum of the parts in order to kind of flesh out a, a more complete picture of what's going on. And so that, that's the idea of this project is we want to do the same thing. Um, but now instead of like audio and text, which is you know what Google and Facebook is doing, um, we want to fuse microscopy and simulations and spectroscopy and, and, and so on. Um, so within Department of Energy, th this is kind of like a big thing that people are very excited about. And the way this project works, like I mentioned, is that we have um, automation that lets us fabricate and characterize um, each one of these things all at once. Um, and then I run a team of machine learning AI people who kind of, our job is to ingest all of that and you know, figure out what to do with it. This is probably the only picture I actually have in this whole talk of how of how we actually do machine learning. Um, but it, it's probably simple enough that you can just get from the picture. So the idea is that you have all of these different modalities, right? It could be stuff like images. It could also be stuff like, um, this is what's called a stress strain response, which says, what's the force required to stretch um, a material out a, a given amount? And so the idea is we take all of these and we use a variational autoencoder to encode them into a latent space where we fuse them together. There's something called a product of experts network. Um, the specific thing doesn't matter that much. It's, it's just that we take all these compressed, these encoded representations of each modality and we fuse them together into a, into a single modality. And then we decode, right? So for the the physics agnostic modalities, you just run them through maybe a convolutional network or transformer, division transformer, something like that. But the physics-based models, we can encode these data-driven models that I talked about in the first half of this talk. Um, so we can actually, um, we can get some physics in there in order to identify physical relationships. And so the interesting thing about how all this works is in the latent space, we ask for something called a Gaussian mixture prior. Right, so we ask that in the latent space, the data will disentangle into these clusters and each cluster encodes where there's a relationship across the modalities. 
So what this does is you can say, okay, here's a, here's a picture. Oh, that's part of this red cluster right here. And this red cluster will have this physics model attached to it. So this, this is something like a Rosetta stone, right? It lets you translate across modalities. And then there's a ton of math under the hood about um, uncertainty estimation and, and probabilistic models and, and interesting things that you can do with it. But hopefully that, that sort of gives a, a picture of what it's useful for. And so I'm just gonna show one example about how you can use this. We have something, this is a 3D printed metal lattice. And we have, a, this is called a uniaxial compression test where you just take this lattice and you crush it. And so we have two modalities here. We have images of specific lattice geometries. And then we also have these, these stress strain curves I mentioned, right? How much force does it take to compress the material a, a certain amount? So the idea is when we feed these two modalities into this framework, um, in the latent space, each one of these black dots represents a pair of an image and a stress strain curve. And it's disentangling this into two clusters. And so you can see the clusters are visualized by these red dots and you can see them swapping the black dots back and forth. Um, it's not actually swapping it, right? It's just doing this when you're trading with stochastic gradient descent. Um, but once it's disentangled into two subpopulations, you get an image, right? That, okay, this is what the two microstructures look like. And then you can fit physics models that encode how you could simulate each one of these microstructures. So in some way, there's lots of ways that, that we use this around the lab. Um, for scientific discovery, the interesting thing is it, it's a tool for hypothesis generation. So you can say, oh, I've got these two different um, physical responses, right? This material, this orange one is much stronger than the blue one, but now it'll re reveal what's hiding in the other modalities that's associated with that uh, superior performance, for example. Um, let's see, I'm doing for time. I'll, I'll just do this last bit um, and hopefully we can get to some questions, which is hopefully more fun. Um, so, so I alluded to how material scientists want these causal embeddings. And so I'm sure all of us in some sort of like pop science level have heard about correlation versus causation, right? Like if it rains, people have umbrellas. That doesn't mean that umbrellas cause rain, right? Rain is what causes umbrellas. But it turns out that from, in terms of like the mathematics behind probability and how to actually describe causation as opposed to correlation, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so traditional machine learning just tells you something about correlation, right? You feed it all of your inputs, all of your data labels, and it'll tell you what tends to appear together at the same time. Um, but you could rewrite that, you can interpret that. Um, if you've taken a course in probability, you could write that with conditional probability. You can make it look like B causes A or A causes B, if there's two events A and B that occur together. And so in, there's this nice example that I've stolen from uh, Shorkoff's textbook, but um, you can consider the setting where you, you have a bunch of cities, right? And for each city, you have the altitude of the city and the temperature of the city. So scientifically, you would be tempted to say that the altitude causes the temperature, right? Because it's like the ideal gas law. You, you go up in altitude and it gets colder, but it's completely valid to say that the temperature causes the altitude, right? Like if you wanted to design a ski resort, you would do that on top of a mountain. And if you wanted to design a beach resort, you would do that at sea level, right? So even though it seems like there's a clear causal variable, it can be valid to describe many different causal representations of, of, a, given, of a given system. But for us, you know, so it quickly gets very philosophical and it's very hard to, to piece through. But, you know, just from an engineering perspective, if we can come up with any sort of causal mechanism, um, we could identify a precursor to rare events, right? Like I mentioned, like a wildfire that, that will eventually lead to a, a drought or something like that. And so um, debating about whether I wanna get into this or not. It, it turns out that probability isn't mathematically, it, it's not enough to actually describe um, cause and effect relationships. And so 
it turns out that there's a second object that you need, which is a, a graph or something called a directed acyclic graph. And so the idea is if you have two random events, X and Y, if they're dependent, right? Like if you look at the statistical correlation between them, um, if they have some sort of dependency, then there's this one particular school of thought that um, that, that means that there's a hidden variable Z which causally influences them both. And so once you account for Z, um, if then they become independent, then you've identified a causal relationship. So if, if you're not familiar with probability or stats, don't, don't worry about it too much. It's just an observation that the traditional language in machine learning is, is not sufficient to actually describe things. What you need is this graph, right? And so a directed acyclic graph means that you don't have any loops. Um, if you have three nodes, you're not allowed to have an edge, A points to B, points to C, points back to A, because that would mean something like circular reasoning, right? That would mean um, right, A causes B causes C causes A. And so what we want is a way to get rid of all this stuff. And the way people typically do this is just by brute force. Like they just check every single permutation of what could cause what, and then they check whether that's statistically dependent or independent. Um, so that obviously doesn't scale up once we have like all these material science modalities or, or things like that. And so the idea is that we can combine all of this framework so you don't just get clusters in a latent space, right? You actually encode into a DAG in a latent space that, that reveals the, the cause and effect relationships. So that, you know, that, that might be a little bit too superficial um, to actually understand how it works or um, or just be confusing if, if you don't have the um, statistics background. But but th this is the sort of stuff that, that um, th that's really on, on the leading edge of, of what people want to get machine learning to do in scientific settings. So maybe maybe I'll just close there and if there are any questions I can I can take them. I'll, I'll just leave these questions up. Um, to maybe see discussion, if there is anything. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Good. Hey, thank you very much. I think this is pretty much exactly what this audience was looking for because they are at the beginning of the use of AI and machine learning for science and medicine. And we've talked a little bit about some of the projects that have been done here and the fact that you pointed out to me many years ago that we are doing scientific machine learning here. So I thank you for that. And at this point, let me open if there's any questions. I see that Daniel put a converse, uh, comment in the uh, comment section saying fantastic presentation. He was unable to attend in person today because he's ill. Questions, anyone? We have a microphone. Go ahead. Sorry, just one procedural question. Uh, are you able to share uh, just like publications from some of the uh, research and the projects you talked about, especially the most recent one with the uh, uh, the embeddings of the directed acyclic graphs in the latent space? I just want to yeah, sure. read more um, on that. So everything's on my Google Scholar. That's the best. Um, there, there it is. Um, and if you sort by year, you'll find um, a lot of a lot of stuff like that. Let me find the one that that's about. So if I can make a quick comment while he's scrolling there, that when you are a PhD, you will write a lot of papers. That this is the currency of the realm. So yeah, so the, this is the paper that that's based off of. This is a preprint um, that. We are refactoring to submit to Nature right now. So a lot of the results, um, there's some preliminary results in here, but if you want to understand um, the mathematical details about how it's set up and, and so on, this would be the place to look. And also feel free, you know, if anyone has questions, if you're more comfortable, feel free to send me an email. Um, a lot of, you can find a lot of talks on specific things that I mentioned today on, um, I have a YouTube channel and you can find, um, you can find deeper dive, more technical lectures about all of them. Our next question comes from Sabosa. 
one of our PhD candidates here in the lab. Go ahead. Hello. Um, excellent talk. I actually enjoyed the materials uh, engineering part because I have been curious like how, so I don't know if you're familiar with, there is a lab in MIT called self-organizing, a self-assembly lab by Scholar Tibbetts. And he uh -huh. looks into like self-assembly of materials like that. And I was curious like how we can bring artificial intelligence from CPU and, you know, like your traditional things, but use on directly on materials um, and like engineer uh, materials that has like that AI or some sort of a computability encoded in the, in the intelligent uh, design of the system. So in, in that spirit, I just wanted to ask you, have you ever explored um, application of um, neural cellular automata in, in understanding like the physical properties and constraints that you want to model in the, in the system or, or have you run any um, cellular automata based simulations to encode those? Because recently I think um, there was a paper book called Neural Cellular Automata that showed that having a three cross three as a convolution filter that can encode the rule to uh, result in the growth of a system uh, for from a single pixel to a target morphology. And here in my current research, I'm like uh, currently working on different aspects of um, ODEs. Like, can I reach the final state as a fixed point attractor of the system as a dynamical system? So I was hoping that have you looked into like um, those coupled uh, the the physical constraints as a dynamical system and uh, implemented in some sort of uh, mm -hmm. neural flows or auto encoder or solo automata. Sure. Yeah. So there, there's a few things that you said. So you know, first you mentioned self assembly, and so it's maybe worth commenting on distinctions about how you can understand self-assembly and, and similar classes of problems, right? So there's things like, um, there's stuff like alpha fold, right? And protein folding and, and things like that, which is very similar type of problem, right? Where you have some geometry and you wanna understand how that geometry can be configured to give a certain quantity of interest. Typically, in, in places like AlphaFold and a lot of the people using graph neural networks for molecular synthesis and, and places like that, they're not actually building up a model of the mechanics, right? They're just trying to figure out a way to interpolate from geometry in a black box to a quantity of interest. For, for AlphaFold, it would be a, a binding location or something like that, right? So um, what we work on is that there, there needs to be an underlying physical process because scientifically that's the thing that, you know, that's what you wanna understand. It's not just about making predictions, it's more about figuring out the path that leads to a certain behavior so that way you can engineer around it and exploit it, right? Um, so, you know, going to the thing that you said about cellular, cellular autom automata, um, that's not something that I've, you know, I'm familiar with it, but it's not something that I prefer working with. Um, the kind of tools that we work with are related more closely, you know, so that genetic algorithms and so on are sort of a classical um, generative approach um, to, to those kinds of problems. The stuff that we look at is tied a lot more to differential geometry and partial differential equations and like the mathematical structures that physics are built around. Um, so um, we do a lot of machine learning bracket dynamics. Um, so, so if you're familiar with like a Poisson bracket or, or these kind of things from modern physics, um, those are the descriptions that we tend to work with for these physical systems, um, as opposed to um, cellular autom automata or, or, um, or genetic modeling where you're working with a Markov chain or, or something where you're, you're talking about a discrete set of choices that could be made. So they're, they're all appropriate and everything makes sense. It's um, That's just what we work with because that's our strength, but um, that's a great area to be researching. So thanks for sharing. Um, so just a follow-up. So um, when you said that you're using um, like uh, the physics term, I, I, I'm not familiar with, but I just wanted to 
clarify like are you trying to use neural networks to find out the equations of the dynamical system or you are using some sort of a like neural ODE based like or couple oscillators where you um, parameterize the basically the flow field or the vector field of the dynamical system and then yeah sort of different property. right so so typically the way a differential equation would work so, so it's maybe a higher level of, of abstraction in terms of mathematical modeling right so something like a neural ODE you would have a neural network and you're learning the right hand side of an ODE for example right that that's working with a differential equation as the fundamental description of a model brackets um and we do a lot of models with exterior calculus and stuff like that these are kind of ways of describing the energy of a system under which the dynamics would evolve so that would be like once you've learned a di once you've learned these dynamics or once you've learned this energy or entropy or, or things like that um then the dy the ODE would kind of be derived from the energy um, a Hamiltonian neural network is maybe the simplest example of something oh, along these lines. Do you have a paper like the about the concept that you just explained so that I can look up? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we just submitted something to NeurIPS. We have a, we have a bunch of papers along these lines, oh. but um, this paper right here I see. is probably our most up to date version of that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have more questions? We got another question across the room. Suppose it. Can you pass that mic around? Um, yeah. So I had a question about, you sort of mentioned this idea of um, with your material science analogy that you can, using AI, you can give these scientists a bunch of data that they normally would not really know how to interpret, like uh, you mentioned the spectrum of light coming off of the laser or something. Um, and you were saying that the scientists, you know, don't find it that um, useful because, you know, they want sort of a more fundamental understanding of what the neural network or the machine learning is actually uh, figuring out rather than just like plugging it into the AI and then getting out some answer like mm -hmm. oh this is the strength where they're like okay but what is it actually seeing so mm -hmm. my question was could you sort of elaborate on that like say you give a neural network some data and it comes to some conclusion what then goes into the push of like trying to understand what it's doing like getting behind that black box as opposed to just using it how it is or like how do you balance just using the AI as opposed to like trying to maybe make some formula or law out of it? Right. So um, let me let me answer that in two ways. So the first way is let me give an example of, of what I mean by this. Um, so one problem that we're that we work on is um, it's called tribology, but it's the study of friction. So you have a coding, you drag a needle across the coding um like a record player um, but you progressively push the needle further down until you scratch off the thing so that tells you what hardness the material is rated at and how much um strength it has that you, you can count on it being able to protect what's underneath so for that problem um there's a mechanical test that looks at like the force and and so on and, and measures that but we also looked at what's called an acoustic emission um, which is the audio, it's a microphone that's measuring it. So the interesting thing is that some modalities tell you a complete picture. And that's what I was describing. A scientist would want to get their, their hands on the ties to a theory with some math to it so that then they can derive things and make conclusions. Um, but the problem about a lot of those kind of measurements is that they're very slow. So if you want to use robotics to maximize the amount of designs you can explore, you can't actually do all of the, we call them like Cadillac measurements, like the, the full picture and whatever. Really what you want is to find maybe a low fidelity, cheap measurement that you can do in a quick and dirty way. And now maybe it doesn't give you the full picture, but you can do it um, 
a hundred times as fast. So that means you can collect a hundred times as much data, which means you can explore a hundred times more designs, right? So that that's the way people want to use these things. Um, the the question, you know, about how you actually get that is dependent. Like when there's physics, and so that that's why in, in this variational inference framework I introduced. Um, that's why we decode into physical models, because then you can relate images to physical performance, right? You can translate in between modalities, but that's the point of what that lets you do. Um, and then embedding into a causal graph, what that tells you is um, even if there is no physics, right? Maybe there are two things that happen in modality A and B, which are cheap modalities that you can measure really easily. And when both of those happen in a certain way, then you get this um, desirable response in what would usually be a slow modality, but high fidelity to collect, right? So th that that's the point, right? Is that if you can find these causal precursors, um, you could design an experiment to measure those as opposed to um, these things that are slow, but a complete picture. So ho I, I don't know, ho hopefully, does that get at what you're wondering about? Yeah, definitely. And um. I had a second question, slightly unrelated, but mm -hmm. um, just as far as like working in a national laboratory, right? You have all this research going on around you. Like, I'm curious, kind of what the structure or hierarchy is as far as like getting something done. You know, do do they approach you? Because you mentioned there's a lot of collaboration. So I'm wondering, at what point do you maybe like you have a research problem and you realize, oh, first we need to know this. You know, do you then pass it off to somebody else? And is a lot of that done? within one laboratory or across like the multiple ones that they have um, over the US or like, how does that kind of structure work as far as getting a problem done? Yeah, so all of the entire national laboratory complex is a complex human system with its own psychology to it and whatever, right? So it, it's not like there's one set of rules for for how it works, it's more that you know, there's something like hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of people who all want to do science, and they're all motivated to do it together. The specific mechanism, you know, it's more that people share your values and your interests, and everyone has deep technical training, and so that's conducive to collaboration. The specific mechanism can be can vary a ton. So, you know, typically people will come in as a postdoc before they're a scientist. When you're a postdoc, your postdoc advisor would have um, written a grant, a lot like a university, um, gotten funding to cover your time, and then you would just work on that project while, while you're there. Um, but you, once you've gotten that funding, everyone has their own funding to work on their projects, but if there are two nearby projects, then it's very common for people to just, you know, help each other out on both projects, and then you write twice as many papers, right, for the, you know, so th there's a lot of, um, Kind of leveraging uh, similar projects in, in order to get more bang for your buck. Um, we also work with, when I was a postdoc, I, I probably had a, a couple dozen university collaborators. So I would travel around to universities. I'd give um, a colloquium or a seminar, um, not unlike this one. And th that was a, that's a big part of your job is not just doing research, but also disseminating it. And then when you're when you're giving these lectures, that, that's how you meet people, right? And the the real thing about research is it's hard to come up with ideas and to be creative and to do new things. So it's it's really pretty easy if you're if you're doing sort of um, you know, either you're doing creative stuff or you're the world expert on some established thing, right? People want to either get a hold of your ideas or they want to get a hold of your expertise. So collaboration just sort of naturally follows from that. Okay, do we have any more questions here in the room? Not seeing any, I have one question for you. At the beginning of your presentation, you had an about Sandia slide that you showed us and there was a list I think of departments and such and there were a bunch of names on there. And I noticed that one of those slides said Andy Wang on it. Is that the famous Andy Bunny Wang? No, different Andy. 
just my friend. Andy. <laughs> okay. I know there's a famous guy in the, uh, in the, in the world of IOT and hackers named uh, Andy Wang. He goes by Bunny Wang and he's the guy that actually hacked the Microsoft connect and won a thousand dollar prize for doing it. And just yesterday I put his book over on the bookshelf over there. It's called hardware hacking. Uh -huh. If any of you are interested in hardware hacking, he, he's a resource for that. Uh -huh. All right, then. Well, I thank you very much for making time for us. I think that, uh, you know, that this was probably a good way to wrap up. Today is the last day of this course. And uh, I think you all have a peek into uh, where you can potentially. Um, oh, let's see. I think we have a question on the chat. Yes. So Daniel asked. Oh, Daniel, are you? Go ahead, Daniel, if you want to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask, you talked about model-based approaches and you talked about some of the more agnostic approaches to scientific machine learning and, and kind of the, the history of, of how we've gone from one to the other. Do you see the future of scientific machine learning being in more model-based approaches or in more agnostic approaches? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I didn't get into the how very much in this talk about how we do all this stuff. Um, the way, you know, in high consequence settings, you need to guarantee that you can solve a model and that the model will be as accurate as you're willing to collect data, right? Like it won't bottom out. And even if you collect more data, you won't get a better answer. Um, it needs to be stable. And needs, like, there are all these requirements that purely agnostic approaches can't give you. There's, there's no physical or mathematical structure there that you can use to, to build these guarantees around. Um, but at the same time, you want that kind of flexibility, right? You want it to be black box. So you don't need to know the physics ahead of time. The data can tell you the physics. So the stuff that we work on, um, which is the majority of the, the talks that I would usually give, um, is about how to just sprinkle in the right amount of structure. So for example, you know conservation laws hold. There are these kind of modern physics um mathematical objects that you can work with to guarantee that those properties hold without knowing what the actual governing equations are right but you you know whatever the model is it'll um it'll conserve mass momentum and energy is the simplest version or for electromagnetism there's stuff like gauge theories and you know there, there, there's like fancier analogous things so um, I don't think either of them are going to work. It needs to be the thing that sits right in the middle where you're not wasting data trying to learn the stuff that you know holds, right? But in, it has hooks that you can take advantage of to prove things, but it, it's black box, right? So that, uh, some sort of hybrid. Awesome. Thank you. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. Sorry. So I have one last question. Uh, just this question reminded me. In the beginning, you said uh, something about moving beyond physics-inspired machine learning, and I'm assuming that includes uh, PINs, phys physics-inspired neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting optimization technique. What's the real, uh, from the sense of that slide, although I really haven't heard much of them since they came out, why, what's the limitation that's causing you to move away from that optimizing for preserving a physical property technique, given the computational mm -hmm. expense of ensuring it by design in the model? It, it's not that there's anything wrong with a pin. So, so pins came, came out of our research center. Um, they're, I, I use them all the time for all sorts of things, right? It's just like another tool in your toolbox. They're incredibly flexible and you can do stuff with like 20 lines of of code that maybe 10 years ago would have been a whole PhD thesis and taken years and, and so on. Um, the downside about them is that the properties that they bake in to your prediction, you do it by penalty, right? So you regularize your loss and maybe it's a PDE residual, maybe you penalize um, whatever property you hope does hold, but it's a multi-objective optimization problem, right? So that's a lot of different things. How do you weight with each one of those in the loss. And then those properties will, it's like a wish list. They only hold to however well you're able to optimize that whole thing, right? So for plenty of problems, sure. you don't need tight structure preservation. You don't need to exactly get the physics right. You just need to get it in the ballpark. And that's why they're flexible and really useful. 
but stuff like electromagnetism, you can't, you'll get the wrong answer if um, like your magnetic field isn't exactly divergence free to like 10 to the minus 15 precision and, and so on, right? So it's just application dependent. You know, sometimes you need, you need more than that. For, uh, for those extremely sensitive applications is using a pin-based approach to sort of get a jump start and then maybe migrate to a structure preserving approach that's formally always going to satisfy your properties. Is that a thing that exists now? Yeah, or sure. It's a thing like that, that. that people will do. I mean, I mean, once, you know, for those of, if anyone's interested in simulation, what, what you'd learn once you study how simulation works and, and so on, is that there are different classes of differential equations and partial differential equations that behave very differently, right? So there are some, like you said, um, the way pins are set up will work for certain classes of problems. For those ones, it makes sense to start with a pin as like a quick and dirty solution and, and so on. Sometimes that it won't even be a quick and dirty solution, it'll be a great solution. Um, but there are some problems where it just, it won't even make a prediction. Um, it'll, it'll just give you something qualitatively incorrect. Okay, that's interesting. I'd have to see some of those examples. Yeah, Maxwell's equations would be maybe the simplest one. All right. Well, I thank you very much. It's now uh, about quarter of two in here. And I want to release the students to get back to their projects that they've been working on. I don't know if you can see the back of the room. Two of them have already sneaked away and have their heads down in front of the computer. Um, because today is the last class. I understand that we're going to be doing presentations with some of you next. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. So I thank you very much for making time. I find this fascinating. I trust that everyone else here did. Uh, after I clean it up, this will be put on the lab's YouTube channel. Uh, MPCR lab on YouTube uh, will be available if you ever want to refer to it. So thank you. And I thank your employer for letting you free for this opportunity. And uh, people here have been enjoying some dried mangoes. I'll bring you yours in Philadelphia in August. Excellent. Great. Thanks, guys. Right. Nice to meet you all. Bye. We'd like to extend you a, uh, whatever you left. Oh, it's okay. I'm here. Oh, wait. <laughs> and we'd like to extend you a formal invitation to come and give us a lecture in person, possibly uh, in the fall or spring semester. We're organizing, still in the early stages, we're organizing a conference just with various experts in the field, so. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for the invite. Excellent. Bye. I'll let you know. And I thank you. Bye now.